Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Uh, my name is Hold it close to your mouth. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Without blowing you out of the room. Okay. My name is Amy Fletcher, and I should acknowledge once we have the slides up that this work and this presentation is part of a research project that the Royal Society of New Zealand generously funded. So I do want to give credit there. It's a multi-year project that I'm doing with two colleagues at the University of Canterbury, Jeremy Moses and Jeff Ford. And we're looking at the global debate on lethal autonomous weapons. And we may have some people dialing in from New Zealand who might get to speak during the question and answer session if the technology cooperates. So I've recently returned to the United States. I'm one of those, just FYI, for whom COVID prompted some changes because I loved living and working in New Zealand, but I am a Tennessee girl. And travel just got too expensive and too unpredictable. So if there was a problem at home, it would have been very difficult for me to get home. So I recently retired from being an associate professor at the University of Canterbury. And I'll be starting as a visiting professor of political science at Eastern Kentucky next month. So that's my background. So if we could slide. So again, the Marsden Fund, I do want to give credit to them and my colleagues. Now, that's kind of off screen. We might have done better to use the smaller ones. But you can see, does that ring a bell with anybody? Do we have any boomers or Gen Xers in the room who remember Dr. Strangelove? Okay, I want to go back for a moment and let me ask if you're willing to share. I come into this as a political scientist, so I'm interested in the policy, the regulatory, the ethical, and the global issues. Do we have any engineers in the room? Okay, if you want to bring your technical expertise in, that would be wonderful. I don't pretend to be an engineer, though I know the essentials about lethal autonomous weapons. Do we have any theologians? obviously very relevant to this question. What about veterans? Any veterans in the room? Okay, very relevant. I mean, in a sense, it's all relevant because I would argue that this is one of the core political, ethical issues of our time. And my goal here tonight, in about 15 minutes, just to set a framework for our discussion, is not to tell you what to think, though I'm happy to share my personal views as they're currently developing, if you're interested later but more to, again, provide some background, quick background to this issue and some ways of thinking about the key questions. So, the reason I put Dr. Strangelove up here, if you're interested in military history, history of weaponry, history of technology and warfare, clearly in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s, throughout the Cold War, a lot of thinkers in the military and the intelligence community in the United States and the Soviet Union looked up in the late 40s and realized there really wasn't a blueprint for nuclear weapons. I mean, war has always been brutal. I should have asked, do we have any pacifists in the room? Because that's also quite relevant to this discussion. So nuclear weapons, again, it took a a bit of time, but the world began waking up fairly quickly to the fact that there was no real precedent, that we had to start thinking anew about what it meant to wage war in a context of mutual assured destruction. I'm going to argue that lethal autonomous weapons represent another revolution of that level of importance. Some critics will argue that these are incremental. They're not as scary, they're not as different, they're not as overwhelming as they might seem. And again, I think there is a huge debate to be had on what national and global regulation should look like. But I would argue, to use the lingo, that lethal autonomous weapons systems are in fact not incremental, but are disruptive. In other words, they are changing the very nature of warfare, and we do need to think seriously about what kind of world we're collectively creating if these weapons become normalized. So, so. so very quickly, again, to 
make time for discussion. There's some debate in expert circles about what fully autonomous would mean, but for our purposes, a working definition is that lethal autonomous weapons can independently search for and engage targets. That's obviously key. So the ethical and the strategic question both becomes, where is the human in this? And we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Now, if you're being specific, we've had autonomy in weapons since at least the 1970s, and some ethicists would argue that landmines are a very simple binary example of an autonomous weapon. So again, we can each maybe come to different conclusions about where we would put lethal autonomous weapons on the trajectory or the timeline of weapons development. But the key thing about this moment that we're living through and having to make decisions about as citizens is moving from defensive to offensive. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but the lingo, if you're in certain circles, is do you allow the weapon to take the kill shot? Or do you always have to have a human in the loop? That's the core ethical question. So, with credit to The Economist, this is from 2017, and this just gives you an idea of the gradations. So they looked at weapon systems currently being developed. 50 or so of the 154 systems they looked at with autonomous targeting ability have a human in the loop. That human makes the final decision. The human possibly in the loop. And then the human either on the loop or outside of it, moving again closer to full autonomy. Now I just want to quickly go through about two or three screenshots. Uh, this is relatively recent news that just gives you an idea of how seriously different voices in different countries are taking this issue. It can seem very distant in some ways, very specialized, but it's actually one of the core, again, political issues, I would argue, of our age. So slaughter bots is, to me, a troubling new metaphor. But this refers to swarming drone strikes, which would be incredibly lethal and very difficult once they've been unleashed for a human to pull back. Lethal autonomous weapons, this is the IEEE, one of the leading engineering societies, and while they do a lot of work on AI and are very positive about our AI futures when it comes to lethal autonomous weapons, many people associated with that institute believe that they should be banned at the global level. Russia, Russia's an interesting player in this debate. Putin plans a robotic weapon capable of destroying entire cities in minutes. And Russia is also pursuing at a quite a rapid pace, which is not to say there aren't other countries, but we know Russia's pursuing suicide bots, whose goal is to cause disruption for some strategic advantage and then blow up and do even more destruction after the fact. So, when we think about lethal autonomous weapons, and we go back to the point about how nuclear weapons literally changed the war itself. If you agree with me that lethal autonomous weapons are doing the same thing, here are three reasons why. One, I love this quote, but I also find it very significant and very powerful. In the future, there will be no lines on the battlefield. In other words, lethal autonomous weapons are both a result of and a driving force of, next slide, what's being called hybrid warfare. Now things aren't as clear in the 20th century or weren't as they were in the 18th century between combatants and civilians. I'm not arguing that there was a clear bright line there and now suddenly lethal autonomous weapons disrupt it, but they do blur it even further. So hybrid warfare, war that can happen from any direction, and it's difficult to know who's originating 
these weapons and these technologies. Speed, another quote taken from the American side of the issue. These weapons will be too fast, too small, too numerous. And they will be too complex for humans to ultimately control. And these technologies, I found this a very interesting quote from a military expert. These technologies are taking us to a place where we may not want to go, but we may not have any choice. We may be unable to avoid this. And finally, flash wars. From a strategic and political and ethical point of view, think about the 2008 economic meltdown, if you will for a moment. I know that's a dismal thing to have to remember. But one of the technological problems that made the 2008 market meltdown worse than it otherwise would have been was the amount of computer trading that was going on. And once the algorithms and the autonomous trading decisions got going, and a problem was recognized. It amplified and escalated dumping those stocks, and then you had cascading effects. So this is where the idea of autonomous flash wars emerges from. What happens if you set off a chain of events that you may have been in control of at steps one, two, maybe three, but the algorithm the autonomous aspect of the weapons begins cascading in such a way that the human cannot necessarily, or the military cannot necessarily control it. So just a few more things and then we will open it up for discussion, which of course is our purpose tonight. From a regulatory point of view, where are we? Well, the United Nations, since the 20th century, I believe it was the 80s, we have an international convention on certain conventional weapons. And those who argue that anti-lethal autonomous weapons advocacy and activism is the anti-nuclear stance of this era would point to the fact that as hard as it is to get global agreement, we have agreed to ban landmines. We did agree after a lot of work to ban what they call blinding laser weapons. So there is currently very serious high level attempts to have a ban on lethal autonomous weapons, a global ban that all signatories will abide by. However, this gets complicated by the fact that on the one hand, the UN Secretary General himself has not been shy about stating his point of view, which as you can see here, direct quote, this kind of thing, in my opinion, is not only wrong, it is morally repugnant, and we need a global ban. These countries that you see here, I won't go through each of them, but there's approximately 30 countries that have already stepped up to request and sign for a ban on lethal autonomous weapons. But, this is complicated. Well, there's nuances in each of these, and we can discuss those if that's of interest. There are nuances across these countries, but this is a pretty high-powered group of countries if you look at it that while they may differ in how much regulation they would accept, definitely do not support a ban and have made that clear at the UN. You also have certain countries that right now, their domestic politics, they're being drawn, they're somewhere in the middle. So the next slide, the campaign to stop killer robots, it's active around the world have some colleagues in New Zealand that are very much active in this organization. Many of them have led aspects of it. New Zealand is a country where there are many people hoping to get New Zealand to sign up to the ban. Right now, New Zealand does have many ethical objections, but it has not signed up to a ban. Germany, France, there's some other countries we can talk about that are somewhere, if you will, in the middle. So, to wrap this up, interestingly, that slide that you just had, this is some data that the Campaign for Killer Robots took from an international 
national survey. Those are the number of people, not all that long ago, in China, Russia, Britain, and the United States, that at that time, when asked the question, wanted to see a ban on these weapons. So again, from a political point of view, from a democratic and ethical point of view, it is the case that this issue is very much becoming a flashpoint, just as nuclear weapons were in the 70s and 80s. And the very last thing I want to say, to maybe kick off the discussion, but that can obviously go in the direction as David mediates. The last slide, this is an intro, I think there's so many different directions you can come into this discussion. And again, if you are a pacifist in the truest sense of the word, and I have deep respect for that, then the answer is pretty clear. War is wrong, and these weapons, by definition, are in war. If you are not a pacifist, you find yourself somewhere along the spectrum, then you have to start thinking, well, where do I stand? And where do I think the world should stand? On the question, first you have to ask yourself, is the war itself just? And as you probably know, there's a theological and philosophical tradition across many countries that trace back to antiquity that, yes, war is to be avoided wherever possible, but there are just and unjust wars. If you have decided that a war is just, you then have to ask the question, even within what might be considered a just war, are lethal autonomous weapons ruled out? Is there something about the autonomy, the lethality, and the human out of the loop. That means that like blinding laser weapons or like landmines, we just can't allow any of the world's militaries to go there. And that we need international sanctions such that those who might try are then brought back into the community of nations and held accountable. So that's just a quick overview, and I'll hand it back over to David to open up the questions, or would you like me to? Hi. Yourself? Countries 
using that term at all costs, which means they're willing to do anything to get their ideals to win. And, and that plays, I believe, a central part in this whole discussion. I think that's a great place to open up the discussion and maybe hear from some others. The way I'll come at that issue is first two things. I agree with your assumption there. Now, whether this is something that's irrevocable, whether this is something that can be changed, that remains an open question. I mean, we have faced these sort of issues before, and we had people that didn't give up, who kept fighting the good fight, and you did end up with bans on these particularly lethal weapons. But let me say two things and then see if others want to jump in on your point. First of all, if I were to, my personal point of view, to be honest, I might be doing a bit of a dodge here, is development. Because my head and my heart are in conflict. My heart wants to join the campaign to stop killer robots. And I'm very familiar with their work and people that are doing really hard work on this issue to try and get a global ban. I am quite a political scientist. I'm not a pacifist. I'm what we call a realist. And I tend to assume that there will be points in history where major nation states are going to fight it out for dominance. So I'm very ambivalent in the sense that I really wouldn't want to put a position on the table at the moment because, again, my heart and my head are in great conflict with each other. The other thing I would say about your point is so much of the debate depends on this historical moment we're standing in. If this were the 1990s, we might be in a very different place. Because remember the 90s, there was globalism, and democracy was spreading, communism had been defeated, and democracy and peace were breaking out all over. Well, I've said to my students to try and frame it for very young people, if you will, I think if we were able to teleport back to this moment, someone from 1913, 1953, and 1993, back into this discussion, once they got used to women being in the room, and once they got used to the computer, I think the person from 1913 would figure it out faster. Because unfortunately, this issue, from my point of view, and it comes back to your point about at all costs, is happening at a moment where all of the great powers, if you will, are back in conflict. We don't have the Cold War where you've got, well, that was a very a dangerous space to be in, in one sense. You had two stable antagonists, and they were kind of on the same page, not ideologically, but on that point, I just read today in the paper that Joe Biden has opened up a red phone with China. I remember red phones being a Gen Xer and growing up in the Reagan years. We had that direct line between the Soviets and ourselves. Well, we now have one with China. And on the news tonight, as I was prepping to come out here, there were two military people saying a current report that's come out that says our Navy could quite probably be defeated by China. Now, in the 90s, it was uncontested that the U.S. could not be defeated by anyone. So you're right. I mean, we are in a world where the great powers are now all back on the stage. There's no stability. You've got a rising China. Russia wants back in the game. The U.S. doesn't want to lose power and influence. So this issue, dovetailing with that time frame, I think will, unfortunately, I hope my colleagues forgive my pessimism, make it very difficult to have a global ban and act on this country.
is kind of moot as far as window dressing in terms of the rate because as much as we may want to um, de-escalate that bandit, there are other countries that may not want to um, see that within view and can actually do something about that by uh, transcending any type of boundaries. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in on that? What do you think? Is anybody hopeful? I mean, again, I know some of you, I would expect, you know, you lived through the 50s and 60s and the anti-nuclear movement and the green movements. And is all hope lost? Or is a ban something worth fighting? I know you're not saying it isn't, but it could be worth fighting for and still not happen. But is it worth fighting for? Is there anybody who wants to make that? Okay. Hope springs eternal. We have, while we have to be careful, any international agreement has to have verification procedures, yes. But we have been pretty successful since the 70s, even through some difficult times, in not using biological weapons. We somehow managed to get that norm embedded. We've somehow managed since the Geneva Convention and even World War I, you know, that you think of the destruction there and no, we're not going to use gas and there are certain chemical weapons that are out of bounds. So again, I don't need to lead the direction and necessarily, a, you know, it's just we're doomed. But I do take your point. Again, it is going to require, which again, in the 90s, but right now, needing China, Russia and the United States to all agree on the rules of the road for lethal autonomous weapons is going to be extremely difficult to do. The larger global political environment to me does not seem to be facilitating that. Many of us have probably seen the Terminator series uh, and Skynet, and Skynet became autonomous and locked out humans and reacted on its own. Um, theoretically, that's possible, and that may be a cautionary note if we get too far into autonomous uh, weaponry or autonomous anything. Autonomous robots, autonomous workers in your household, if there is a possibility for them to become autonomous, we're in trouble. Yeah, I agree. I mean, but, but to me, again, just to play a bit of counter, even though I've confessed to my own pessimism, I do think, as some ethicists have pointed out, certain missions might be more ethical with autonomous technology. I mean, part, we tend to think of the civilian combatant divide for obvious reasons, that's extremely important. But it's also unethical by the principles of just war to just willy-nilly send your men and women out to die in something that you know they can't prevail in. I mean, there's a whole ethics around how commanders are to treat their soldiers. So some ethicists have said, now wait a minute though. I know it's new. And anything that's new, you know, especially again with all the science fiction that we've had and Terminators and all of that, but if you think about it, what if rescue missions, what if it becomes easier to rescue people? What if it becomes safer to get food and water to people who might need it? What if that autonomous weapon is better because it won't get tired and it won't get scared and it won't have systemic bias that you know we, we can't even bring to the conscious level that's something that might interfere. What if war between the machines is actually a step forward ethically? Anybody want to 
by that, <laughs> so to speak, because I see no, I'm seeing a lot of um, dissent in the room, which is fine. I'd like to hear from you. Why is that? Why are we tend to be more reluctant about these weapons than we might think? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, actually, they'll bring some net advantages. I'm sorry. I feel like we, we all feel like we want them for the better. Like you say, for the rescue uh, and the better of mankind, rather than the destruction of mankind. We don't want them to put a cap on it because we're making the progress mm -hmm. that benefits all of us. Yeah. But if there's that risk of getting deeper into the rest Exactly. It's with most advanced technologies, and again, I know some of the people in the room might be just opposed to nuclear energy on principle, but you could make an argument that nuclear energy from a climate point of view, if it's done safely, is better. It's cleaner, faster, better. You can also use it for bombs. So the technology of AI, we don't necessarily want to just stop. That would probably be quite foolish. But you're right. It, it, it's like nuclear energy. I mean, once those secrets have been unlocked, you've got to hopefully come up with some sort of regulatory mechanism that can restrain the state or certain bad actors from using these for destruction. And I know this is a very serious and in some ways, you know, kind of difficult topic to think about. So I don't mean to bring down the whole room, but your point as well. We talk about the nation states, and in the world of great power rivalry, there's a reason for that. Can you imagine, given how much damage you can do with one lethal weapon, if these were to fall into the hands of terrorists? So you're right, we can't ban it. The genie's out of the bottle. I don't think we would want to ban it. I got mean, lost coming in here and drew up map list and got some nice little directions in. So I don't necessarily know that I want to stop all of the algorithms and autonomy and computer technology, but yeah, that crucial question of how you bring in the destructive uses in this case is a profound one. So, uh, I, I thought is uh, we have a list of the countries that are probably going to be the ones to develop the technology. Uh, first world list of countries that they didn't want to ban. And the smaller countries that probably don't have the infrastructure to develop the weapons out there to find who wants to want to ban. That's, that's the first observation I made. Uh, the second one is uh, technology once the secrets are unlocked, they can be, technology can be spread very, very rapidly. It's not like a nuclear weapon where you have to have the plutonium, you have to have the, the, uh, the priming mechanisms and, and, and the infrastructure to store nuclear material and stuff. That's, that stuff doesn't get around so quickly. It, it, it's proliferating through the world. Uh, but technology is easy. You can punch a few buttons and all of a sudden, some data that's on this computer could be halfway around the world. And so the spread is a lot more rapid. So I'm, I'm less concerned about you know China and the United States and Russia having technology that's maybe you know, at least somewhere on level but They also tend to realize that you know, if they use it, that the other large players are going to fly back. I'm more concerned about like the little guys that's in that CBS news clip that basically they get a copy of the technology and go, oh, I'm going to start shooting rockets at my neighbor over here, or you know, drone attacks, or uh, slaughter bots, or whatever. In the hands of those unstable, smaller countries, the technology can easily get in their hands. Not like, not like a nuclear thing. It can easily get in their hands, and it can easily be copied and spread. And, uh, and those unstable.
Yes, and I think that relates to this point about flash wars and hybrid wars and what some are calling 24-7 war, for lack of a better term. That, you know, the days of here is military X with uniforms that the state has given them and authority and accountability, and here is military B, and we're going to declare war. B is going to declare war against A, and the war is going to kick off at a certain point, and then one side will win and will negotiate a treaty. The problem with these weapons and this notion of hybrid warfare is you do, it's so porous. It wouldn't take much, not necessarily to prevail in some sort of big state we're fighting a war for this territory in the Pacific, for example. But you're right, it wouldn't take much to keep relatively low level, but for the people living through them, incredibly lethal conflicts going. To flip that, and I'd be very interested if you care to share, I don't think you'd mind me telling you on potentially YouTube. Um, one of my uncles is a Vietnam vet. And I tell my students, he was drafted in June of 68, so he really went to Vietnam. If you remember that era, that was the absolute apex of the fighting. And I was interested in his take as a soldier on the autonomy issue. And I think there's some complexities there as well. I don't want to overvalorize or romanticize the reality of war. In fact, I've sort of noticed that some of the most ardent pacifists are men and women who fought it because they know what war does. So without trying to delve into any kind of sentimentality, but I do think, I think it's a very brave thing to do. I have respect for veterans quite a lot. Is there something about taking the human out of the loop that just, as Kiwis might say, doesn't seem cricket? Do the veterans have any? Because the few I've spoken with, I come with, oh yeah, new technology, and to a person, and maybe this is a Vietnam thing as opposed to a younger thing, I don't know, I'd have to do a study. There seems to be a sense that you're losing a certain kind of valor, a certain kind of commitment, a certain kind of, you've got something at risk. Whereas you're right, on the one hand, part of the problem is keeping low level but intense lethal conflict going outside the scope of international regulations or treaties or whatever. On the other side of the spectrum, there's very difficult questions around the ethics of, say, the United States being able to fire drones while someone's sitting in Miami country that's being fired on is very poor, very impoverished, and by definition they're having to use human beings. And again, I want to be very careful saying that, particularly on video, because I know that's a complex question and I don't feel that I'm at a point where I could adjudicate what the morality of that is. And I know there have been some psychological research which shows that while some older veterans are sort of like, well, you know, you're playing video games, we were actually out in Domain, you know, with guns. There has been some psychological research that shows that while it might not be physical, some of our younger soldiers who are doing the drone attacks are psychologically suffering as a result of it. I mean, going home at five, knowing that you took out, you know, a caravan somewhere in the middle of the desert, it's not easy to put that down when you go home, even if you feel that your cause is just. So you're right. I, I don't quite know where we land on this. to make 
decisions, the necessary decisions to counteract the decisions that are being made by the autonomous machines. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to be, you know, we're, we're going to be trying to catch up and can't. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be free for all. And you're right, even if we this point is about are we getting into a space where by definition we will lose control of the machines. Right. And there's so much science fiction. I've been around some engineers and they get very uncomfortable when people start talking about terminators and the like. Because of course they're you know down there in the trenches doing machine learning and they're oh no, 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 it's not gonna be like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Well it doesn't have to be like an Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, it doesn't have to be the Terminator for us to begin to feel and for it actually to be real, that at a certain point, the more you hand over and the faster the decision making becomes, by definition, there won't be anyone in the chain of accountability that can necessarily give you the whole picture. So you're right, that's both ethical, but that's also legal, which is another aspect we probably want to bring in here. One of the reasons that the debates around the bans are so difficult Part of it's the big power politics and the need or desire to prevail and project power. If an autonomous weapon, if, to use the lingo, you take the human out of the loop completely, and something goes wrong, however imperfect it might be, we have rules of warfare. Now, not everybody obeys them. But if you think about that for a second, the humanity of that sometimes moves me. That even when it comes to war, we at least try to have some rules. Well, part of those rules are accountability. And to go back to the Vietnam era, well, I know it was controversial, and I know people have differing opinions about it to this day. The Melee Massacre was recognized to be wrong. You had an American soldier turn against other American soldiers because he realized that what they were doing, or he believed strongly that what they were doing in that village was immoral. That it was absolutely dereliction and a violation of the rules of war. Well, if we hand over more and more of the decision making to the weapons, and the humans are completely out of the loop, who are you going to sue? Who are you going to get reparations from? Who do you appeal to? in the International Criminal Court of Justice. Was it the unit, the machine, the kid who programmed it? Was it some Google engineer or some engineer with, you know, in China who put together the algorithm? So the whole question, as you put it, not just of control, but of accountability, I think it's really, really crucial here, and um, it's going to be very interesting to see if we can reach any sort of conclusion about that. On that point, and I just want to let some others jump in, just so you know, in terms of the big three at the moment, the USA's current position, current official position, is that it does not want a ban, but it intends to always have a human in the loop. To use that dread phrase again, any final kill shot, there is going to be a human in that chain of accountability. China is in an interesting position because it officially supports the ban on use, but is very clearly pursuing research on these weapons and also exporting them. And then Russia's position is quite interesting because Russia, you might give the points for honesty, has said if we're not moving towards full autonomy, then what is the point of any of this? No, we're not going to support a ban because the whole point is it increases our ability to project power. Right? So again, there's nuances in these different positions, but they're I think the people that are hoping to have a ban are facing a very difficult uphill climb at this moment. Yeah, sorry, you haven't jumped in. Do you mind standing up here? I've been musing about something during this meeting that I'd like to throw out. Suppose 
that each country that builds these autonomous lethal weapons programs their capabilities of their weapons, all the spe specifications and everything, into a supercomputer. No country would be able to find out what the other country's capabilities were. And then you run the supercomputer that simulates an attack on country A, country B, country C. You know, and after a while, it may well be that you know countries E, F, G, and so on would also get involved in it. And some of the countries are going to win, and some of the countries are going to lose. The countries that lose are going to say, "Oh my God, we've got to improve." Or autonomous weapons. Next year you run another war simulation in the supercomputer and it becomes a little bit more even and eventually you keep running this around until everybody realizes that everybody is going to get totally destroyed if uh, we go on with the development of these weapons. And maybe then you would possibly have a situation where you could have a ban that everybody would observe. Uh, I don't think myself either that there's any possibility to enforce a ban otherwise because these systems are all developed in secret and there's no way to even tell who sent this thing out if it's carefully designed and, and produced. So you can't e even trace them back to whoever the maker was. Uh, and I think that, you know, these uh, wars could start off with attacks on military installations, but as soon as one of the countries realizes that it's losing, it's going to probably start uh, sending its drones and things out into the civilian populace just to kill people. I mean, Hitler did this during World War II with the V-2s and the V-1s. You know, over England, you know, his whole mission was to just uh, create devastation among the civilian population. Uh, the, the only other alternative I could see to this is that you have a situation where an actual war starts between some of these things and you have an unbelievable catastrophe occurring, just like, you know, what was demonstrated with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I think that's one of the reasons when the, when the uh, world saw the devastation that this could cause, it basically made nuclear war unthinkable. So I just wonder what other people would think about all this. Well, I, I think, in a way, I think it's a good idea because that would if it was all in one pool, then all everyone that pooled into that supercomputer would know their risk of what can happen. And that way, it's right now it's a guess who's got the strongest military, who's most likely to win, and who's most likely to lose. That's all just summation where if it was all pooled in like that and everybody contributed to this supercomputer, then the projection would be a real life realistic risk known by each participant. Mm -hmm. um, and that could make a big difference in decision making. It could, and as somebody who studies forecasting, I really like that idea. I can't remember which general it was. Was it who was the one that first talked about the fog of war, though? I mean, you're right. I think we could get some good data. But then again, once this stuff is unleashed, I think it could go. I think the number of scenarios starts to multiply exponentially once you get into these cycles. So you're right. But if it could give us some solid data that would encourage restraint, I think that would be a fantastic initiative. Yeah. I just, you, I really picked up on the phrase you said, if this is released, mm -hmm. but Pandora's box has already been opened. Like, this is already out there. Autonomous systems and semi-autonomous systems are already controlling most aircraft that fly around this world. My background is mostly in aviation. Oh, okay. The 
reason most crashes occur is controlled flight into terrain. The pilot got disoriented and intentionally flew the airplane into terrain. Mm -hmm. So what they teach pilots is that if they get disoriented, disoriented, turn on the autopilot. And go against your instincts. Go sometimes. against your instincts. Yeah. Because the autonomous system built into that airplane is actually better at flying the airplane than the human in a lot of situations. Okay. And you can actually go right up here to McGee Tyson Airport and buy a brand new jet that has a feature built into it, a personal jet that anyone can buy if you've got the money. It's got a button on it. If you push that button, it takes control away from the human, and that jet will take the passengers mm -hmm. and go safely land at the closest airfield no matter what happened, you know, your, your pilot could have a heart attack and collapse. Mm -hmm. Any passenger can reach over and push that button and the airplane will go land itself autonomously. And it's safer than a human at the controls. It's already out there. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It, it yes. can't be put back in the box. So from a technological point of view, you're right. Are we running to stand Correct. still or already running behind? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you that. Well, and my, my second point would be that it's not the nation states that we would have to be worried about. If we had a ban on autonomous weapons in all nation states, well, then who is to enforce this on non-nation state aggressors? You know? Right. Hamas. Uh, ISIS. Al-Qaeda. Any of these people that are not a country, they don't have a country, they're right-wing extremists in the U.S. They're not part of a nation. They're not going to follow the rules of the UN. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's going to stop them is somebody else with a better weapon. I can see that point. I mean, I still believe, I mean, and certainly respect those who are pursuing. I think nation states do need some rules of the road. But you're right, the rules of the road for nation states do nothing if you have non-state actors coming in to cause damage or disruption. Yeah, and I, I thought of one more thing. Um, the types of warfare that have been banned by the United Nations, like mustard gas and landmines, they're not particularly useful anymore in modern warfare. So what if they're banned? Nobody was going to use them anyway. This is something that everyone is using all day, every day already. It's not going to go away if we ban it. So, if I might, I'm not, I'm not trying to force an argument, I just want to kind of keep the discussion going. If you were at the UN right now, do we just then say, okay, everybody that can do it, just put the pedal to the metal and just whoever gets there first and has the better, smarter, faster, more autonomous ones, Bonnie, for you, you get to rule the world. I'm exaggerating. But I mean, I'm just curious, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I mean, where do we go with that? Because I tend to agree with you. You clearly know what you're talking about from a technological point of view, coming at this from aviation. The political scientist and you know, the person that has some real ethical reservations, though, I'm like, so where do we go with that, though? Because there's no ability to affect the rollout of these weapons, or are we sort of just at the mercy of what the big state governments decide to do, or the terrorists for that matter? What might... well, there's a reason I'm no longer in aviation, and because <laughs> I realized that if you said if you were at the UN, if I was at the UN right now, I would not be working in the War Department. I would be working on educating mm -hmm. women and underprivileged people in parts of the world where these non-nation states are causing trouble. Because mm -hmm. that's the only proven way to actually stop wars is to be ensure that the general population, especially young women, receive education. And then the war doesn't ever start. You can have all the technology you want, and it's but if cost the trillions. people are not willing to be aggressive against each other, and then it's just technology. Okay, so the technology and then there's the root causes. I would be addressing the root cause of war, not the means of inflicting it. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? I don't want to dominate here. I think that's quite 
interesting. I have a feeling if we have colleagues that are dialing in from New Zealand, they're like, yes! <laughs> right? I mean, they might go even further because, again, I mean, many of them are working very hard to be part of a coalition that can achieve a ban. But your point about root causes versus technological solutions, I think many of them would agree with that. Um, the technology, I worked on a uh, very high level project, it was worldwide, and um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff told me to go back down to IT when we got a deliverable soon. <clears throat> it appears as though the data is falling off the end of the earth. Technology is not that great and they're humans holding it and <clears throat> they're making mistakes and I think I see that as a huge problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole thing kind of reminds me of <clears throat> excuse me, Tom Paxton's song when a thought got loose or something <laughs> and then they tried to sink it in the ocean and it kept coming up and coming up. It appears as though we need some ethical management good, solid, and I don't know where that comes from these days. I would definitely, as a political scientist, endorse that. Because again, I'm open to the fact that there are many, many different opinions around this very complex issue. I don't think I have the answer, but part of my answer, if anyone cares, is, yeah, the technology can be very sophisticated. It can be very off-putting to people that are not trained in neuroscience algorithmics, machine learning, deep learning. I mean, there is a level of technical expertise, but I think your point's twofold. One, it's not fail-safe. So we might be overestimating the degree of efficiency or control that we might have over these systems. I think that's an excellent point. And one of my you know, major missions, if you will, one of the reasons I got into this whole field of technology policy and ethics I think everyone is affected by these things. And I don't think you ought to have to have a PhD in computer engineering to get into the debate. I mean, that's why I'm really glad to see so many of you came out tonight, because I know this is your time, and you, know, you have to come out and exert the energy to be here and listen and share your views. And I think, if I may, without being melodramatic, I think this is the kind of thing that's really important because it matters that people know, and it matters that people, not everybody's gonna be a computer scientist, or a soldier, or an engineer, or a pilot. We're all citizens, and we're all in this. I mean, one way or the other, we're all affected by the world that's created through this discussion around lethal autonomous weapons. So again, I absolutely concur.